How many of you are familiar with fights over inheritance? Such as, just think of your own family. I, I don't mean the inheritance of billionaires. I'm talking about inheritance of uh, maybe your grandma and grandpa. Or maybe your Uncle John and Aunt Sally or, or others like that. How many of you are familiar with some of the fights that can occur because of, um, you know, who gets what, who, who does this, who, yeah, sometimes those can be something else. And some of us have even experienced some of that with our own parents, right? As, as uh, that time comes that you're trying to divide things up, sometimes it can be terrible. Other times, uh, maybe not so bad, but, but we, we all know, you know what you're getting at, right? Sometimes uh, you see things come out of people that you think, why in the world are they acting like that? Uh, at any rate, that can be bad. Uh, let me switch gears. Let's go to another situation. How many of you have ever had a situation to where your kids were being bullied by someone? Right? Maybe they were being bullied by another kid at school. And you, you hear the stories, you see how upset your own kids are, and you see that it's just, it's just really getting to them, and, and you wonder, what can I do? Well, wouldn't you just like to go and smack that bully? Would you? I mean, we're, we're laughing, and I know most of us wouldn't, and that's a good thing. But uh, wouldn't you just like to go smack that bully? Or better yet, wouldn't you like to go smack their parents? Right? Uh, something like that. Yeah. Uh, we've, all, we've all had that temptation there, haven't we? I, I think that you, you understand that. Uh, Whitney didn't get bullied much at school because she was homeschooled, so that, that helped. Um, she'd have arguments with the dogs once in a while, but we could usually resolve uh, some of those. If you were to go and smack the kid or smack the parents, wouldn't it create more trouble for you? Wouldn't it create um, uh, some type of legal problems uh, that you could get in trouble with? And here, that person started the trouble in the first place, and yet you're being held legally responsible for what you went and did about it. So yeah, you have to be careful. You know what? The, the same thing happens in a football game. Uh, when, you're, when you're watching football, and I like to watch football, especially uh, the NFL is the one that I watch the most. But uh, a lot of times when guys will get the yellow flag thrown on them for a personal foul, they're not the ones that started it. The other guy, and you go back and you watch a videotape, you see the other guy was doing something mean and nasty first, and this guy turned around and punched him, but guess what? This guy got in trouble for it because he's the one that the referee saw, and it doesn't matter. You're not allowed to punch someone no matter what, so they throw the flag. Yeah, it can, it can lead to issues and so forth. Um, my question is, is how do those two examples get tied to the Tenth Commandment? You know what the Tenth Commandment is, right? Uh, you shall not covet. And of course it goes on and gives more. Uh, you shall not covet uh, what belongs to your neighbor, his wife, or his possessions, or all those other things. How are those things tied in? Well, actually, uh, they are. You might get the first one about inheritance rights. You can see how that's tied in. But how's the bully thing tied into that? Well, we're going to look at some stuff like that. So uh, let's get started. I hope you're in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 25. And uh, as we do, let's ask the Lord to open our minds as we think through these things. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you how it instructs us. And uh, today as we look at uh, these particular laws that uh, Moses is talking to the Israelites about, that, that we can learn much from them and that we could understand uh, how they apply in our lives. Uh, work in our hearts, Lord. I'm praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, obviously, we're talking about coveting. I think you see here, I've got desire leading to wrong actions. Uh, that'll, that'll give you an idea of where I'm going with that. But then also, uh, there are more ways to covet than we quite often think of. And we're going to look at some of those. Well, first of all, um, desire leading to wrong action. I think that's probably the crux of the matter as to why the Holy Spirit would tell us not to covet, not to covet all these other things. I want you to think through the Ten Commandments for a moment. The first nine of the commandments are action-oriented. You've got, uh, uh, you should have no other gods before me. Uh, you should have no idols. Uh, don't take the Lord's name in vain. Observe the Sabbath. Honor your parents. Uh, don't murder anyone. Uh, don't commit adultery. Uh, don't be stealing. And don't uh, do false witness. Okay, those are all action-oriented. 
But when you look at the last one, the tenth one, that one is more of an internal thing. That commandment says, you shall not covet. And then, of course, list things not to covet. No coveting. Well, that's talking about internal desiring. That's talking about what's going on inside here and inside here. And it's telling you not to do those things. It's talking about it's what, what internal desires might you have for things. Uh, what lust might there be there that, that you need to be careful of? Um, what things are you strongly wanting? And I think the main issue is, is how is it going to come out? What might you do? How might you act? Because you have those strong desires. You have those things that you're really wanting. Here's, here's the key to this whole thing. Is that these desires can lead to wrong actions to get what you want. And that's what uh, you need to be aware of as far as those are concerned. Well, think about this. Desire really is the birthplace of sin in your heart. If you think about all the different sins that uh, you might commit... It starts with some kind of a desire inside of you. Whatever, whatever that desire might be. If you're having problems with your tongue and you're saying things that are hurtful for, to people, well, what desire do you have that's making you do that? I mean, maybe you, you just want to reach out and punch someone, but you know you shouldn't do that. So you do it with your words. And you're punching them with your words. You, you've heard the idea of, uh, of passive aggressiveness. I never realized how passive aggressive I can be sometimes. But, but isn't that true? You think of someone who's sarcastic. I think sarcasm can be passive aggressive, right? Where you're wanting to put someone in their place. Well, well, why is that? It's because you have some desire. There's something you want. Whether it's a material thing or whether it's a concept thing that you want. There's something that you want. And therefore, you take some action about that. And, and that's the problem that you get here. Now, sexual sin is easy to see, so I'm not even going to spend any more time on that. You can certainly see where that can lead to wrong actions and so forth. But uh, most other sin, I think, falls under this as well. Think about Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. I, and I've gone back to his uh, Sermon on the Mount a number of times. That's in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. You don't have to turn there. But, but when, when you're there, Jesus was taking some of these basic commandments that they were given, or basic uh, rules that they were given to live by, and then he was expanding them and showing how they expanded into other areas to help the people realize that you may not be breaking this one thing, but think about the other things that you're doing that relate to that. So you actually can be sinning in this way without actually doing the particular thing listed, but you're doing it in other ways. Let, let me give you an example. Uh, Jesus talked about murder. Murder is an action. I mean, you can see the action for sure, but then he expanded that, if you'll remember. He talked about anger. If you're angry with your brother... Uh, and, and, and he went on to say, angry with your brother without a cause. And I think what he meant was without a just cause. Uh, you're just angry for whatever, whatever reason where you probably shouldn't be angry at them. He said, that's, that's like committing murder in your heart. You've got the same feeling that comes out in that action. He says, what about the abusive words that you use? Thou fool or raka or whatever else you would say. And, and in our culture, we have different words that we use. When you use those words, that flows from the same heart attitude. He also talked about animosity toward others. If you'll remember when he was talking about that particular rule, he went on to say, if you're at the altar presenting uh, an offering to God and you remember that you have something between you and your brother, leave your offering there and go take care of the problem between you and your brother. Think about it like this. You're offering an offering to God. In God's eyes, it's more important to know, don't offer that weight and go take care of this problem. You see, sometimes people think as long as we're worshiping God, everything's wonderful, isn't it? I think that that happens with a lot of people that claim to be Christians. As long as you can come to a service and sing nice songs and, 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 and enjoy all that, then, then that's good. And that, that covers a multitude of other things. But Jesus is saying, no, stop doing that worshiping part and go take care of this problem first. Why? Because the same attitude that was in there is related to the same attitude that can lead to murder. Okay? Not that Jesus is saying you're about to kill your brother, but still the attitudes are very similar. And he's saying fix those things. So there, there's one example. Jesus talked about something else too. He talked about giving oaths. 
And uh, when, they, when they gave oath, there was some teaching at the time that, that people could give oath um, and use different wording to guarantee their oath. See, here's what would happen. If you wanted to borrow money from someone, you would give them some oath that I'm going to pay it back. Maybe you would sign it. It's like we would sign a contract or something of that nature. But you would give some promise that you were going to pay it back. But they got tricky in those days. And, and they would find ways to get out of their oath. And for instance, they might say, uh, I promise, uh, I promised by the altar that I will pay this back, the altar of the temple that I will pay this back. And then when the person came for payment, they would say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I would have said I promised by the gold of the altar, then I'd have to pay it back because gold is more valuable. But I didn't, so I guess you're out of luck. On that. You see what was happening? They were finding ways to get out of their keeping their word. They're finding ways to do that. And Jesus said, don't do that. Um, that, was, that was basically your line. Basically, you're finding a way to get what you want. Keep that in mind. Remember, coveting what you want. You're finding a way to get what you want without having to fulfill your responsibilities in getting that. So you were finding a way to lie to get what you, what you want in there. I, I remember, and, and I know I've shared this a couple times before, but in one of the books Whitney was reading in high school, it was set in the Middle Ages. And uh, in this particular book, uh, these people were borrowing money from this Jew because this Jew was wealthy and he, he was blessed in his finances. They'd borrow money and then they wouldn't pay it back. And they would say, well, we're doing God a favor. The Jews rejected the Messiah. And so we're doing God a favor by not paying him back. So it's too bad for him. You see, what, you see what he's doing? They would find some way to cheat someone out to get what they wanted. Did they really care about helping God out in that case? No, that wasn't why they were doing it. They were doing it because they were selfish. They wanted whatever they borrowed from them, the money that they needed. That's, that falls under that whole thing of coveting. That's where those internal desires are there and those feelings are there. So, so they were committing all of that. So, so desire is the key when you think about the idea of coveting. Well, let's, let's think about coveting exactly. Yeah, how would you define coveting? Um, probably if 10 of us gave definitions, they'd all be slightly different, but the ideas would be somewhere in this area. Strongly wanting something that you do not have. Strongly wanting something that you do not have. And strong enough that you may take action to do something about it to get what you want. Now, you might see yourself as guilty of wanting something from time to time and coveting. You might see yourself as saying, well, uh, guys, maybe, maybe there's a piece of hunting equipment that I would like to have. Oh, man, I wish I had that. Look what he's got. I, I wish, I, and, and you do something about it so that you could get it. Maybe, maybe you go farther into debt, put it on a credit card or, or what have you. But you might see yourself doing that. Or, or maybe you might say, there's a piece of jewelry. Oh, I wish I had that jewelry. Whether it's earrings or a nice necklace or a watch or something. Man, I wish I had that Well. All of us can see ourselves being guilty in coveting like that once in a while, right? Have you ever seen something where you might jokingly say, covet, 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 because you know, oh, I would love to have that, you know? Um, I'm not really a car guy, but one day uh, when I was at work, uh, a guy drove up, um, and he was related to the people who own uh, the car company, and they drove up in a brand new Corvette. And, and I'll tell you what, this thing looked like the front end of a fighter jet. I mean, it just looked, it looked pretty impressive. Uh, not that I coveted, but I could certainly see the drool coming from the mouth of some of the car guys that I worked with. And, and, and they were, well, anyway, we see ourselves as coveting like that once in a while. But most of the time, we stop there. And we think, yeah, I'm, I'm guilty of that uh, once in a while, but, but that's about it. Well, I think what we're going to see today is that the coveting actually goes a lot deeper than that. When you talk about your desires, you talk about the things that you want. Uh, coveting could be your wants, the things that you want, just simply like that. It could be uh, a lack of trust in God. You know, maybe you don't like your situation. And, and you, you're, you're upset because someone else has what you don't have, whether it's more finances to pay their bills or what have you. And therefore, you're upset about that when you, you realize that, wait a minute, I'm not even trusting God here. And the Israelites would have had that same thing. God is telling them, look, I brought you out of, the, out of Egypt. I brought you out of slavery. I put you here. I'm giving you this promised land. And yet still... You're going to have trouble with coveting. You're going to still want things so badly that you're going to take actions to do it that would be sinful, sinful actions. 
And it's a lack of trust in God. Uh, maybe, you're, maybe your coveting is in the form of trying to control your circumstances. This is how I want this to go. And you're not thinking about coveting uh, a piece of material of something or whatever. But, but you're actually, you're coveting everything to work out the way you want it to do. So therefore, you're trying to control the people around you. You're trying to control what's happening around you. I believe that can come from a heart of coveting as well. Um, maybe there's times when you go too far to get what you want. Remember that bully in school? I want that kid to leave my kid alone. I'm sick of this. So I go and beat the kid up. And then I end up going to jail because of it. You went too far. There's a proper way to handle it. Does the situation need to be handled? Yes, it does. Do you need to uh, go to the proper authorities? Yes, you do. Can you slap him because you want to? No, you can't. You see? And I believe coveting lies behind that. You want it a certain way. And every, all of us understand why you'd want it that way. You want them to leave your kid alone, but you can't go that far. Got to be careful. Uh, what about being dishonest for your own advantage? You know, is, Are there ways that you can, you can be dishonest to help you out? Okay, we're going to look at some ideas here. Uh, I want you to notice how Moses applies it. And, and I believe that that's exactly what Moses is doing here and giving these rules. I believe he's laying them out in a way that kind of follows the pattern of the Ten Commandments. And I think that we're in that pattern right now where he's going to show the ideas that flow from a heart of coveting. And we're going to look at it. Now, it's true that Moses doesn't explicitly call these coveting. So if you want to call me out on this and say, Pastor, the last ten times you've preached on this, I disagree with how you're doing it. I don't think that they tie into those ten commandments. Okay, I won't argue too much with you because I know I am, I am stepping out on a limb a little bit saying it. But I, I think it's been so obvious. I think it's been pretty plain. Each one of these groups of rules that we've been looking at certainly fit within the spirit of that particular Ten Commandments on that particular situation. And that's what I see here. These all deal with inner desire or intent. Something that you're desiring, something you're intending to be done, and you're trying to make it happen. Therefore, you can, result, you can resort to wrong action. And uh, I want us to look at that. So now we'll get into uh, more of these here. Uh, beginning in uh, chapter 25, uh, we're going to look at the first one, which I believe is selfishness. And you'll see what I mean as we go, uh, beginning at verse 5 of chapter 5, chapter 25. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger. Outside the family, her husband's brother shall go to her, take her as his wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. Now, if I just stop here for a minute, most of us, we're, we're Americans. We take it from our cultural standpoint, and we're all going, ew, right? I mean, I, I get that, but you got to remember, different culture, different mindset, different aspirations, and we'll look at that as we go. Let me keep reading verse 6. And it shall be that the firstborn son, which she bears, will succeed to the name of the dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. But if the man does not want to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate of the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up a name for his brother in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak to him. But if he stands firm and says, I do not want to take her, then, um, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot, spit in his face, and answer and say, So shall it be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel the house of him who has his sandal removed. And so forth. Uh, well, let's, let's just look at this one for a minute. Now, this is what we call leveret marriage. Now, it's not talking about Levites. It's actually coming from the Latin lever, which means the brother-in-law is, is the word that it means. So they refer to this as the leveret uh, marriage rights. And before you get too grossed out by thinking through all this, think in terms of an arranged marriage. Lots of cultures do arranged marriages. We don't, we don't like arranged marriages here. I mean, you might want to arrange your children's marriage. But they don't want you doing anything with it, right? Uh, Whitney's quite often said that she's had a couple moms come up and say, Oh, I want you to meet my son. And Whitney says, But the moment a mother is trying to introduce me to your son, I'm going, Back off, back off, right? Uh, no, we don't want anything to do. But a lot of cultures do that. And uh, frankly, 
a lot of these cultures end up with very good marriages. And, and the marriages go well. It's, it's not because they were in love before they got married, but they found out how to be in love after they were married. And they knew how to work together and how to, I mean, it was all, it was all part of a cultural thing. So they were able to do those. So this is kind of, if you will, along the line of an arranged marriage. Only in this case, it was a widow who lost a, a husband, and then one of his brothers, who is available to be married, uh, could then marry her and, and, and go from there. Uh, the key here, though, is that they were very concerned about inheritance rights and the name of the deceased brother's name continuing in Israel. If he's married and then dies without a child, his family line ends. And, uh, and his inheritance, what's going to happen to what was his that, that would have been passed down to him? And, and remember, God's bringing him into the promised land. God is giving each of the tribes these lands. And then within the tribes, each of the family units are given sections of land. And then that is passed down from family to family to family. And that was an important thing. Now you've got a brother that dies without someone to inherit his stuff. And his name just stops. And that was, that, this was important to them. And so therefore, this particular law was designed so that he would have an inheritor to be able to take those things. So uh, the next available brother who can would marry her. Now, this is not talking about a brother who's already married. If you're already married, you can't do it. And in fact, adultery, and, and the book of Leviticus spells out specifically, adultery with a brother with his, with his brother's wife was punishable by death. This is not talking about adultery that way. And so if they're already married, it's a done deal. But if there's a brother who can be married to her, then that one would have the option of being able to do this. And if they were to get married, then the first child that was born, the first son specifically here, the first son that was born would be considered the child of the deceased father, of the deceased husband. Now, it would still be their child, uh, but, but it would be considered the child of this first uh, brother, and all of the inheritance from that first brother would go down through this next son. And then, as this brother kept having more children after that, then his next children would inherit his own particular property, and so forth. And that's how they would do it. Um, I kind of thought of it this way. I, I know, uh, like for instance, Lynn's family, uh, she has an aunt that they had a large dairy farm. And a couple of the sons took on the dairy farm. And, they, and they've really made it a huge operation. I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands of cattle. I'm not sure how much they have. But they, they've actually bought out several other farms around them. And they've just got a huge operation. Well, you've got these two brothers working together. Well, where, who's it going to go to when those brothers die? It would pass on down to their family members. But if one of the brothers died with no children, then the other brother can either find a way to help him have inheritors, or say, nope, it's all mine. I get it all. Too bad. Too bad. Sorry, buddy, that you died without any, but it's all mine now. Is it starting to make a little more sense of how coveting figures into that particular law? Yeah. You could say, ooh, here's my chance. Or you could say, nope, I'm going to do what's right. God has given this to us. And God meant for my brother's name to be passed down and for him to have inheritance, inheritors. I'm going to see that this happens. And, and that's what they could do. That's the whole point uh, behind this whole thing. Um, and that's why it's, it falls under the coveting laws. He could be selfish or he could be selfless. Now, remember, they're in a culture where arranged marriages was somewhat common. And so, therefore, this would just be another form of an arranged marriage. So it wouldn't seem near as weird to them as it does to us. And you just got to kind of keep that in mind. But, but the idea here is, are you going to do the best thing for your family? Are you going to do the best thing for your brother and for their family line? Are you going to do that or... Are you going to just try to, you know, if this works out better for me, I'm just going to forget it. I'm not going to do that. And, and that's an issue here. And if you'll notice, the, the, the penalties here uh, wasn't that they were penalized legally or that it was some rule that they were breaking and therefore they had to pay some big penalty. What they were, though, is they were shamed publicly. 
is you're unwilling to do this for your family. And so they took a, a, a route that would shame him publicly before the others. And, and, and that's the way that it worked. Uh, Whitney's got a movie that, that we watch that kind of follows this same idea. And they were actually going through the process. It was a modern day version of this. And uh, it was a Jewish families living in, in New York and New York City. And um, they were about to go through this process where the girl was going to take the guy's sandal off and throw it and then spit on him and, and do all that. And then at the last moment, the guy said, no, no, I don't, I don't want to do this. Uh, and, and he decides to marry her. And, and the movie goes through how it all works out and how they actually end up loving each other in the end. So it's kind of a, a happy movie. It's called Loving Leia. If you ever happen to see that, it is a Hallmark movie. But uh, it's, it's done well, I think. And it does shed light on a modern version of how these particular rules and so forth work out. But that's why it's put under the category of coveting. What do you want? And are you willing to take actions that are not best for everybody else, but are just selfish for your own good? And, and that's the key of what it's getting at. Well, let's move on. There's a couple of, this next one might surprise you. It's like, what? what why is this in there? Uh, verse 11. If two men fight together, and the wife of one draws near to rescue her husband from the hand of the one attacking him, and puts out her hand and seizes him by the genitals... Then you shall cut off her hand, your eye shall not pity her. And again, you're like, well, that's weird. Why, why, is, why is that particular one here? I believe here's why this is, this is here. Does she have a right to try to help her husband? Yeah, I, I believe she could. If her husband's fighting with another guy. And by the way, it's not talking about someone trying to murder her husband. It's talking about them fighting. All right, and so, so be careful not to read too much into that. But can she go? Yeah, I think if she can kick and push and pull and, and separate them, then that, that might be an okay thing. The problem here, she went too far. And this isn't talking about her accidentally grabbing him. It, the, the, the implication here is that she did it on purpose. She knew what she was doing, and she figured, I can get him off. And that's how she tries, tries to do that, and that's going uh, too far. So she's going too far to accomplish her goal. Think about it like this. I already used the illustration of the bully at school. Uh, you could go and smack the bully yourself if you wanted to, but you know what? That's, that's no good. You're going to get yourself in trouble. You're going too far. Uh, follow the proper procedures to do that. How many of us have heard, heard stories on the news of maybe, I, I think there's one story I heard of, uh, of a cheerleading squad. And by the way, cheerleading girls, they can be vicious toward each other sometimes. And apparently there were some girls being pretty vicious toward this one lady's uh, daughter. And the lady actually went and murdered one of the other cheerleading girls to, because it made her so mad. She went too far. And now she's going to have to pay a severe penalty because of that. She went too far. What about your neighbors? They have that party on Saturday night at their house. And, and maybe a couple times a year they have that party. And it just, it's so loud. It just really bothers you. We actually have a house out near us that a couple times a year they'll have a big party. There are a couple houses down the road from us, maybe a quarter mile. But boy, you can hear the music. And in the summer, we like to sleep with the windows open. And it's loud. And, and uh, if you let it bother you too much, it, it could really bug you. We, we, it doesn't bother us that much. We just kind of try to ignore it, I suppose. Shut the window and turn the air conditioner on, maybe. But let's suppose it really bothered you. And you decided, well, I know what I'm going to do. And you go and you burn their house down. That'll show them. Guess what? You went too far. You went too far. You went over the top to accomplish one of your desires. My desire was to get them to stop this so I could have peaceful Saturday nights. Well, you stopped them, all right. But uh, now you've created other problems. I think that's exactly what's going on here, is this person went too far. You know, again, if you need to hit and kick and do whatever to pull them away from each other, uh, maybe you should do that, but you can't go too far. Notice that this comes right after the, the one talking about the lever at marriage, where it was talking about inheritance rights and so forth. She could hurt this person to the point to where now he can't have children. And, and that's violating the whole law of all that. And this is important to the Israelites, and it was important to God. And the Holy Spirit seems to be saying through Moses here, don't go that far. Find another way. Don't go that far to accomplish what you want. Yeah, you want, you want them to stop. Yeah, you want your husband safe. But you still have to do it within proper means. Don't go that far. And I think that's exactly what they're talking about here. It is coveting when you'll do anything 
to accomplish what you want. No, you can't do that. And if you're an angry person, you have to really watch out with this because you could allow your anger to rule you and you might do some things you shouldn't say. You might say some things you shouldn't say. You, you, you might go all kinds of different paths here that would just create bigger problems down the road. And if you're a true angry person, you're, you're not going to accept the blame. You're going to say, well, it's their fault if they hadn't done it in the first place. No, in this case, God's not going to allow the woman to say, sorry, it was that bad man's fault. No, she still has a penalty to pay here. And uh, that's, that's a bad thing. So you've got to, to make sure you don't go too far in accomplishing what you want to accomplish. Well, let me go on to the next one then. The next one has to do with dishonest weights and measures. And this one's pretty, pretty clear to us, but I think we can apply it even further. Look at verse 13. You shall not have in your bag differing weights and a heavy and a light. You shall not have in your house differing measures, a large and a small. You shall, you shall have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure, that your days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord your God has given you. For all who do such things, all who behave unrighteously, are an abomination to the Lord your God. Here's what Moses is saying. You need to... Make sure that if you're selling things, you're using proper weights. Let's say if you're going to buy a pound of oatmeal, you've got a weight that is exactly a pound. And you use that weight so that when the person measures it out to you, you get exactly a pound of oatmeal. Okay? So you've got your pound of oatmeal. Now you go to sell it, and you pull out a different weight that's only about maybe five ounces. And you say, here, let me give you a pound of oatmeal. But you're really only giving them five ounces. Guess what? You can sell that pound of oatmeal as if it was about three pounds of oatmeal. And now you've just made more money. That, that's how those differing weights work. Differing measure would be the same way. If you're supposed to pour out someone a bushel of something, you can have a bushel that's actually a little bit smaller. It's not actually a bushel. And so you can get more for yourself. You can make more money on the same amount than what you originally bought. And that's what they're being careful of. Um, you need to make sure that you are honest in your dealings. I know there's lots of different reasons for why some countries are third world countries, and, and there are lots of different reasons, and I don't really want to go into that, but I believe one of the reasons some of these countries are always poor and always at the mercy of everyone else is because dishonesty rules. And they're dishonest, they lie to each other, they take bribes, they do all that, and I know we have some of that going on in our country as well, but at least in historically, it's been limited to some extent uh, because we valued honesty. We valued that Judeo-Christian ethic of being honest. And honesty is what's good. Remember the old, when they used to say, a handshake is good enough for me? You shake hands on a deal, I'm going to honor your handshake. But uh, when you get people trying to find ways to get around all that, it just creates a mess. And I believe some of those countries stay poor all the time. That's why God is telling them here, uh, you will be able to live long in the land and your community prosper. You need to be honest. Um, we have the same issues today, don't we? You go to the gas pump. I like to read things on the gas pump when I'm pumping gas. And you see that little sticker there where the, where the inspectors have come and inspect? They actually come and they bring a gallon measure and they pour out a gallon to see what is exactly a gallon here and then see if the machine is registering a gallon. And if it's not, they make them fix it. Okay? That's the idea. They're trying to get them to make sure if you say you're giving them a gallon, you're giving them a gallon. And, and, and I know there's lots of different things, uh, different ways people can try to get around that, but that's, that's important. What about this? What about slack-filled product? Now, you might be told when you're buying cereal that you're actually getting 23 ounces of cereal, but what does 23 ounces of cereal look like? You know, you might, you might actually get 23 ounces of cereal, but what if they put it in a big box like this? And it's only filled up about that much. In your mind, you might think, oh, I'm getting that. We need a lot of that. And you get it and take it with you. And they just tricked you. You thought you were buying more cereal than you really were. Now, technically speaking, they weren't lying. They gave you 23 ounces. But they made you think you were getting more. And you bought. And they know that a lot of people are going to just grab it because we were told to get the big box, right? Well, they can be cheating that way. That's, that's slack-filled product. You get, a, you get a bag of chips that looks like a big bag, but there's only this much in it. We, we all have seen it. And I know sometimes it can settle, and I know there's lots of reasons for that. But, uh, yeah, that, that's a big issue. 
And, and the government have tried to have regulations to help with uh, some of those things. We need to watch out there. What about this? Your neighbor comes over and helps you with a lot. And you realize, I, I need to go help my neighbor also. Well, this neighbor comes and helps me a lot. Why well, go over and I help him with something for 15 minutes and I consider it a done deal? You think your neighbor, I mean, your, your neighbor might be pretty gracious and might be all right with that, but after a while, your neighbor's going to say, boy, they never return the neighborliness, or, or very little. We, we need to make sure we're not cheating our neighbors. I'll take all the help you can give, but you know what? I'm pretty busy. I just don't have the time to help you. Yeah, you know. I go over and borrow tools from Larry Domsek once in a while. I need, to, I need to make sure that I'm returning the favor and helping Larry when he needs help. And then, I don't know, maybe I'm not so good at that. But I believe that would fall under this. We need to make sure that coveting is not showing itself in the way that we do those things. But we need to be honest. In this case, in business, have honest measures and so forth. The last one is another one that you might say, well, why is that there? Look at verse 17. Remember that Amalek did to you, or remember what Amalek did to you on the way uh, as you were coming out of Egypt, how, you met, how he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks, all the stragglers at your rear, when you were tired and weary and he did not fear God. Therefore it shall be when the Lord your God has given you rest from your enemies all around in the land which the Lord your God has given you to possess as an inheritance that you will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. Now you might be saying, well, what, what is that uh, getting at? Well, here's what was happening. God had already told them, I am going to punish Amalek. Because of what he did, Amalek was really mean and nasty to the Israelites as they were coming. I am going to punish Amalek. And of course, the way God does it is through his people. And he says, I want you to wipe them out. That is their punishment. My punishment. Now, God could have brought uh, a lava. I mean, he could have caused a, a, a volcano to explode under their territory and, and wipe them all out. He could have done all that, but God chose to use them. They were the hammer that God was going to use. And he said, I want you to make sure that you do that. The problem comes when they get into the promised land and they find relative safety and relative peace and it's, it's pretty good. And they say, you know, I don't want to fight anymore. Forget it. And God's saying, but wait a minute. I told you. I told you what I wanted you to do over here. You need to go clean this up. And they're saying, no. We're, we're okay. I would rather have peace. I think this falls under the category of wanting peace at any cost. And I believe this falls under the idea of the sin of omission. There's things that God tells us to do. But because we have certain values, we decide not to do that. Uh, let me uh, give you a couple ideas. What if you have a relationship with someone that's kind of gone sour? And you need to fix that up between you and that person. And you know that the scriptures would teach that you need to go to them. By the way, the scriptures cover both bases in this. You might say, no, no, they caused the problem. They got to come to me. The scriptures don't give you that opportunity. The scriptures say, if you sinned against someone, you need to go to them. But then it also says, if someone sinned against you, you need to go to them. So it's both parties' responsibility. But you might say, you know what, we've developed some kind of an easy peace here. I'll just leave them over here and I'll leave here and forget it. You're disobeying God. Your, your coveting comes in in the sense that you desire not to have an uncomfortable confrontation. And so you are going to ignore what God wants you to do, what he's told you to do, because you don't want to have that. And well, that's coveting. You're coveting that, that supposed peace that you have, and you're refusing to go and take care of your responsibilities. That's why he told the Israelites to do that. I brought you into this land. I gave it to you. I promised I was going to give it to you. Once you get settled in, don't forget to finish the job. That's what he's telling them here. Well, I got to thinking of other ways. Are there other types of sins of omission, if you will, that we could be guilty of? What about um, when you get way too much change at a store? You know, you go and you buy something, you pay for a 20, and they give you 35 back. What do you do? Well, thank you, Lord. You provided for me wonderfully. And you walk away. 
Or do you say, oh, this isn't right. I need to go back and point that out. Oh, Ma'am, did you notice what happened? Oh, I'm so glad that you fixed that. I remember years ago, a, a number of us went out to eat after a Sunday evening service. We went to Big Boy, and someone noticed one of the gas stations, the price was way low. I think at the time, gas might have been around $4 a gallon, um, and that was back when it was high again, like it is now. And we drove by, and one of the gas stations had the price set at one seventy nine. And everybody was saying, guys, that's 179 go, and people would go, and they were getting gas. Well, then the poor attendant finally noticed what was going on. Oh, no, and went and fixed it. But that attendant might have lost their jobs. Uh, someone, I mean, someone from our church actually stopped in and went inside and said, did you know that your price is this? And they didn't know. It was, it was a mistake. But I believe that falls under the category of coveting. You know, you're taking advantage of someone else's mistake. You need to be careful about that. Um, what about a father who supports his children in a divorce situation? Uh, there are fathers that they're, they're told by the courts that they have to give X amount of support, and a lot of it's based on their income, so what do they do? They go out and get a job where they're paid cash so that the government can't trace what they're getting, so they don't have to take care of their own children. Guess who is taking care of their children? You and I are, though, right? Uh, but they're finding ways to get away around their own responsibilities. No, you need to do what you're supposed to do. Uh, fulfill your, your responsibilities in that particular matter. Personally, I think the idea of working for cash is an issue here. You need to be careful. Uh, some people will work for cash just so that they don't have to pay taxes. Oh, they'll take any of the benefits that come from taxes. When those refund checks come in the mail, they'll take those. When the fire trucks have to come and put out the fire at your house, they'll let the fire trucks in and do that. Uh, they'll take all the advantages, but, but no, if I can work for cash and not pay taxes, I'm going to do that. I, I believe that that's coveting. When we do our taxes at home, I do, I do Whitney's taxes uh, with her, and uh, Whitney does her house sitting, and she gets paid. Well, we made sure we worked it out so that she is claiming all of that, so that she then pays, uh, she has to pay whatever it is that she has to pay, whether it's uh, um, the uh, Social Security tax and then the other taxes. We make sure she's paying that. Why? Because she's supposed to. Now, you know what? When you have to write $600 more in taxes, then you kind of take a hit and you think, well, I wouldn't have to do this, but you should do it. You need to make sure you're not coveting so much that you're willing to do a sinful action to get what you want. I believe that's why Moses is laying out these laws here. Uh, we, need, we need to make sure that we're not coveting and therefore acting sinfully in these things. If you've got responsibilities, don't leave them undone. If, uh, if you're upset about something, don't go over the top in your response about it. Do it, do it properly. Uh, don't be dishonest. And uh, if you've got uncomfortable circumstances that you know God wants you to do, uh, in spite of the fact that they're uncomfortable, go ahead and do it anyway. I, I remember a fellow uh, one time... Um, that said, he talked about family reunions and stuff and how people just try to find ways to get around it. And he said to me, he said, I finally decided, look, if someone says, are you going to go? And I would say, well, I really ought to, but he said, I finally come to the conclusion, if I really ought to, then I just need to do it. Do what you ought to do. Quit making excuses. I believe that would fall under the coveting idea there, too. I really ought to, but I don't want to. Yeah, we need to make sure that we are doing what God wants us to do. You might not think that you're guilty of coveting, but are you? In some of the ways in your life, are you? I know I found out this week in preparing this, I, I've come to the conclusion that I'm guilty of coveting in, in different ways, and I want to fix that. We each should want to fix those things. Do what you're supposed to do. Uh, don't just put your own rights ahead of everyone else's. Consider, what does God really want me to do in this matter? I want to please him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word, and, and thank you for even those times when it's uh, convicting to us. Uh, help us to respond properly. Help us to allow your spirit to weed out those things in our lives that shouldn't be there. And help us to get rid of selfishness and help us to take care of responsibilities. And uh, help us to not unwittingly be covetous. 
Now, Lord, as we uh, go this week, help each one of us to bring honor to you. Help us to uh, uh, do the things that would point other people toward the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm praying this in his name. Amen.